I would like to welcome uh, all of you once again. Um, we will now focus on uh, one of the important pieces of the uh, package reform, which is uh, the draft regulation. Um, and let me start by uh, making uh, a personal reference. Um, I contributed to the negotiation of Directive 9546. For five years, in between 1990 and 1995, I didn't miss any of the hundreds of meetings and meetings and meetings. I had the impression at that time to, to be part of, you know, something such as a, an institutional revolution. But now, a lot of years after, um, having a look to an article which was published end of last week, I can simply agree on an evaluation made by Christopher Kuhner where he said, um, now the draft regulation in terms of ambition, scope, and, and size, is the largest and most complex piece of data protection legislation ever proposed. So we are in front of, of a complicated multi-year uh, process um, and we should now focus on, on substance. Um, last week, um, when the report was uh, presented uh, formally to the LIBE, um, we <clears throat> assisted to a first round of discussions and, and reactions. Uh, it was also an opportunity to focus on a lot of improvements we, we may find in, in the report. Um, I'm not now representing the DTPS, I'm simply here in the position of co-moderator, but uh, in the speech which is published uh, in our website, you will find, for instance, uh, 10 points uh, we highlighted in, in the report. We, we appreciate it a lot. Of course, the report um, is uh, extremely um, detailed, uh, 250 pages, um, 215 pages, 350 amendments. So after one year, uh, we should all recognize that uh, after a lot of workshops, uh, seminars, uh, conferences, debates, it was not so simple um, to make a proper balance of different, uh, different trends. So first of all, thank you. Mr. Albert, for uh, this, um, you know, uh, important uh, contribution. But it's now time to um, introduce a break to the, to the silence, uh, in the sense that we would like to, not to be simply impressed about the work, but to start with, uh, with an analysis of the perspective. I've been asked, um, and Cecilia as well, to um, focus mainly on strategic points. Uh, this panel um, <clears throat> is in parallel with another one on, on the directive. Um, an additional panel um, is uh, again on, on the regulation. We have been asked to focus on um, something which may be considered as political and as strategic. And the second recommendation from the organizers is to be as much as possible provocative. So I would like to apologize for certain candid language. This means that we are not asking uh, uh, panelists to, to, to make long speeches, uh, but to, to be brief. Um, and we would like to open soon uh, space for uh, questions from the public. Um, we, we uh, thank you, Mrs. Lebay, for um, uh, being here. Uh, we know that uh, you need to leave soon. So uh, with your permission, Mr. Albert, I would like to uh, take the opportunity for um, a first round of two uh, short questions to, to you. Um, the first one um, relates to, to the report as such. Um, I'm not asking you to comment in detail uh, the, the report. Um, we understand you too um, need of time to analyze a lot of details, um, but perhaps this is the right time to be candid in front of the public and to simply say, for instance, um, if you can now highlight a point, you um, you appreciated a lot in the report as an improvement compared to the um, to the commission proposal, and perhaps a point you consider extremely 
problematic in the same report. Extremely questionable. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Giovanni, for, for this um, interesting question um, in a panel where uh, Jan Albrecht um, in, is there, so it makes my, time, my, my task uh, extremely easy. Um, so uh, what did we like in this report? Uh, as I said earlier, what we liked in this uh, report is that there is a, a great uh, commonality of views uh, on the, uh, what are the objectives of uh, uh, the uh, future legislation. And these objectives are, of course, the strengthening of uh, the rights of the citizens. Um, of course, Parliament is going to, uh, and Albrecht is going uh, a bit further than uh, uh, we are going. And of course, we will have to test all this with the um, member states. And uh, uh, of course, this is part of the negotiation. Um, we have tried to find the right balance. I think also it is a role of the parliament to uh, uh, go further if they think uh, so. So uh, uh, overall, a very positive uh, uh, assessment of uh, the report. Well, you are asking me to uh, mention uh, things we, we, we like less. Um, well, l let me uh, mention two things. Um, uh, first of all, uh, the role of the Commission uh, in the, uh, on the board. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, we have proposed to have a role for the Commission of the, on, on the board. Um, and of course, Parliament is going in another direction, uh, which will ha give a, a greater role to Parliament and uh, less, if not uh, none, to uh, the Commission. And that, for obvious reasons, we don't like. Uh, we think that in exceptional uh, uh, cases, uh, we uh, should be able to um, intervene to make sure that uh, uh, there is consistency and uh, to make sure uh, there is nothing which will be uh, adopted against the regulation. These very, very rare cases. So, I mean, this is certainly uh, uh, one, uh, one element. Another element I can uh, think of is the transformation of a number of delegated acts into uh, um, uh, ex ex implementing acts. And that, that the other way around, or the other way around, uh, and uh, that's uh, where the parliament will have uh, a greater role uh, to play. And um, the reason why we had um, proposed this, um, this uh, acts were really to uh, give the uh, flexibility and also um, a notion of speed where we could intervene and, and make things clearer when there was a need. So there are two examples uh, in an overall very positive uh, assessment of uh, uh, the uh, report. Um. Let's now move to a second question. Um, which relates to the architecture of the, of the reform. Um, and w without considering for, for a moment uh, the level of guarantees uh, to, be, to be ensured, so the right balance uh, in between fundamental rights and, and, and other public interests, uh, business uh, interests. Uh, let's concentrate for, for a second on you know, uh, future developments of, of technologies. Um, I think we all want a, a new regulation which is not only technologically neutral, but sufficiently uh, modern um, and you know, advanced to uh, face with the, uh, the challenges of the new uh, technology. So on one side we have a, a, a clear demand for uh, legal certainty, um, on the other side, um, you too recognize the need to introduce uh, a lot of provisions concerning delegated acts, implementing acts, because not, uh, not everything should be uh, regulated in, um, in, in the text. On the other side, um, there is a request for um, flexibility, not in terms of severity in regulating the, pro the, the use of personal data, but in terms of a giving space for uh, for changes, um, and 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 then we have now an approach from the report uh, which is uh, more selective on delegated implementing acts. There are concerns that uh, 
there are issues that cannot be entirely delegated to the new uh, Article 29 Working Party, the European Data Protection Board. But on the other side, flexibility is something to consider. What is your vision on, on, on this point? Uh, the Commission will certainly uh, uh, give a contribution to the dialogue, trialogue, uh, and, and I think this is important now you uh, share with us um, your, your vision. Well, on this, we have said very clearly, uh, right from the beginning, that uh, we don't want to mummify the text, uh, which means that uh, everything cannot be set into details into the text. Simply because if we do that, there will not be, as you say, space, I would say, for innovation. We are talking these days about cloud, but uh, maybe in three weeks' time, uh, there will be something new which will come on the market we are not uh, even aware of. So we need to take this into consideration. I think uh, uh, this regulation will not be a success um, if it doesn't cope for uh, other developments without to change the, the regulation. So I think we need to find the right balance in between putting maybe a number of additional things into the uh, regulation, but not uh, too much, and then uh, uh, leaving uh, a degree of flexibilities to data protection authorities and to the, uh, to the board and then uh, leaving a, a number of uh, possibilities as well for the Commission uh, to uh, adopt uh, um, um, delegated acts. So it has to be a balance, but what is key for us is, uh, again, not to have a regulation which will stop or hamper in any way um, innovation and which will again, put too much burden on uh, uh, the, uh, the business. So this is the balance we are trying to achieve in the discussion that uh, we are having both uh, with uh, member states and uh, with parliament. Um, thank you for uh, <coughs> this uh, position. Um, be free to, to, to leave because you, you know you're busy, but we will be, of course, uh, very happy if you, uh, if you stay uh, for possible a question. One can say uh, that uh, there is a need to be a little bit more provocative and, and, and to use some spice, more spice in, in, in the debate. Um, let me uh, exercise myself with, with, with you, Mr. Mr. Albrecht, and start with, with a comment concerning you know, the, the vision of your report. Um, I've heard some rumors, criticism, that um, your report is a sort of a, that's a position, eh? it's a sort of a, it's not me, um, <laughs> it's a sort of a copy and past of a, um, an NGO vision, um, and that you simply uh, supported, uh, you know, one, one, one vision rather than a, a right balance uh, of different interests. Uh, how do you react to this criticism? Yeah, thank you for that good question. Um, <clears throat> that brings me also together with some uh, words said by uh, Francois Le Bay, uh, because we we didn't only uh, with with my report uh, went over the Commission's proposal or strengthen it or lengthen it, but we even shortened and somehow at some uh, positions also uh, perhaps from some views weakened it and uh, also compromised positions in the Commission's proposal with uh, stakeholders' positions. So I can say that uh, this proposal, my report, really uh, involves hundreds of proposals from all sides, and I can say that also because I was meeting hundreds of people throughout the last year uh, from uh, all the different perspectives, and you cannot imagine how my agenda looks like, but at some day I, I work on uh, publishing it, uh, so uh, then you will see how, <laughs> how the such, such things work. Uh, but no, this proposal is not at all 
uh, a one-sided uh, proposal. And I can uh, really say that with very uh, uh, clear words, uh, because you, if you have a look at it, we um, didn't um, we, we, we didn't just leave the proposal uh, as it is where it was quite vague. We uh, even, uh, what, what we, we didn't want to reach just a one-sided result, we want to reach legal certainty for all. And that was what the first point was mentioned in the parliament. We need more legal certainty on provisions which are basic on principles, definitions, that those follow what we had until now. I mean, we have a history on all these uh, legal provisions, and this should be as uh, clear as possible. And then on the provisions for the, in, for the individuals and uh, their rights, and also for the provisions for the controllers and their duties, of course, we uh, reduced the, the scope on what is necessary to really enable the individuals to conduct their rights and to ensure that uh, controllers are compliant with these rules. And that is uh, why we, for example, tailor made the provisions on data portability, on right to be forgotten, that we extended the uh, time uh, for uh, the data breach notification, that we reduced uh, the amount of uh, prescription in the documentation uh, to, as I said, only what is necessary to be able to uh, show compliance with the individual's rights and so on, that we really try to come along with all the legitimate interests and concerns around. But uh, having said that also, I can really say uh, I was not in my position writing this report, my position to write whatever I think as a, as a green politician uh, would be better for the world, but I was in the position to really conciliate hundreds of positions and to find something which is then uh, acceptable to a vast majority of people concerned with this dossier and also, of course, of my colleagues in the European Parliament. And we have a very consensual uh, approach on that. And uh, we, I mean, we had a resolution voted by almost unanimity with all the basic demands we had. Most of them were met by the Commission. That was also why we reacted in a very positive way. But still, we have many things to be clarified, and we try to do that in a way that the legislator is setting the rules, and then afterwards everybody knows what his rights are or what he has to comply with. But just one last word also in addition to that. I am a Green. And I have my own thoughts. Uh, and thinking about, for example, uh, the developments on environment protection so, uh, throughout the last decades, after the 70s and 80s, where it became clear and clear, uh, cl uh, more and more clear, that there is pollution going on and that there is climate change going on, for example. Politicians realized that there is a need for regulation, that there is a need to set a framework, set rules on how the market is going to act and how uh, we are, how the economy is going to work to be as sustainable as uh, possible to save our environment. That was the need of citizens and consumers, which was expressed again and again. And we didn't say at that time. Uh, we have to, but we have to protect, uh, um, uh, for example, a business to emit the same amount of CO2 as they do at the moment, to do their business with CO2 emissions uh, all the time. No, we said you have to reduce your CO2 emissions uh, by, uh, while, of course, being able to do your business. You have to innovate on being more sustainable, on being environmentally friendly. And you, we do it by doing incentives in the market. We do it by, by setting borders, but also incentivizing development on being more environmental friendly and on being uh, uh, on, on giving as much as possible uh, as much uh, possible ability to the consumer to decide if he or she wants to be environmentally friendly or not. 
And exactly that is what we are doing today. And I can say to you, it's still the same. We are not willing to diminish the possibility of our lives to decide freely what we do and to, to, to do uh, and to, to, uh, to do ec economic uh, growth and um, and innovation as much as possible. But we are setting some borders and we are saying, please do it as privacy friendly as possible. And please involve the consumer in the decision if he wants to be privacy friendly in society or not. To, so to use privacy uh, technologies or not. And that is what we ask. And that is why I in my report emphasis exactly one point which is important uh, for my uh, uh, impression and that's the informed and explicit consent of the consumer to decide if you want to expose his personal data or if you want his data to be part of processing or not. According to <coughs> your plans, to the Commission plans, um, this piece of legislation um, may be adopted, formally adopted by hopefully next year will enter into force by 2016. Then we should expect some, you know, implementing measures um, at different levels, not only additional pieces of legislation, but also measures by the EDPB and national law. Um, so this is a legal framework which should um, be entirely enforced, perhaps, before 2020 and uh, should be able to deal with the challenges of the information society of 2025. So a question to you now is uh, what, what we may expect from uh, the debate. Uh, this is a data protection week, the standard CDPB, close to the data protection day, but this year, 2013, is de facto uh, the data protection here, as um, Mrs. Lebay said, uh, it's uh, decisive for, for the content. Uh, your report um, is, of course, uh, a, a key starting point for discussion, a fundamental um, starting point, but is not, um, as you know, the, the last uh, word from the European Parliament. What we may expect now in, in the uh, incoming uh, weeks from other amendments from, uh, from, from the debate. You know, uh, a competition in introducing uh, into the regulation uh, all details um, in terms of legal certainty, in terms of uh, balances of interest, or don't you think that there is a space, this is similar to the question to Mrs. Lebay, for uh, leaving a margin of maneuver to integrate with some additional uh, flexible instrument the, the new challenges posed by the use of, of new technologies uh, and apps, uh, for instance. Don't you see that there is a risk to, to, be, to have everything in uh, because of the legal certainty? I think it's clear that uh, we are still not at the end of uh, what should be the truth uh, about data protection. We are developing. I mean, we are in a, world, in a world which is developing quite quickly that makes it very difficult for policymakers to uh, set the right rules, which are then also legal certain. That's clear. Uh, but on the other side, uh, citizens expect from policymakers to give uh, uh, trust and to also uh, give answers to these challenges in their environment. And uh, I, I, my impression is that we still have some work to do on especially innovation about how consent, for example, can be given on a very on a, a well-informed way and on an explicit but easy way. Uh, and that is very, uh, something we really need to work on. And also how we can conduct services while perhaps reducing the amount of personal data being involved in that. So that many of the new uh, services we are developing, the, the innovation we are talking about, should take place in a direction which is having in mind that there is data protection and that there is a sense about these data protection rules and that consumers uh, would really also request 
technology with, which is as much privacy friendly as possible. And therefore, of course, there is uh, a, a huge amount of uh, a possibility, but we have to also follow that people expect us to um, protect their rights. And my report already, that's uh, very important, I really want to say that, is somehow compromising and if we, if we go away from what the citizens really demand and we listen to them all the time, and I know about many uh, issues which are perhaps already uh, perhaps not tackled in my report, mentioned by many citizens and consumers, if we move too far, then we risk the opportunity that this reform perhaps is not acceptable anymore for a large uh, amount of uh, people out there. And that shouldn't be the case, because we have a win-win situation by strengthening individual rights, uh, by better enforcing it, by giving legal certainty, but on the other side, building one single market and one single set of rules for everybody, so that there's also Equal competition. Um, before moving to uh, the next panelist, may I ask you uh, to to mention uh, a proposal in your report you would like to defend at any cost, um, and perhaps, being candid, uh, a point uh, in your proposal where two weeks after uh, its presentation you find. Uh, a wider margin for maneuver for negotiations? It's always difficult to say. Uh, I mean, I proposed the report because I was convinced that is uh, the right way how to do it, you know? So, uh, of course, there are different, there's different importance in a different set of rules. I would say that... On strategic points, of course. Yeah, I would say, and that was, was being said by the European Parliament in its report, and also due to the whole negotiations in my committee again and again, that this is about following the basic principles and rules what we had until now. So the core of the director from 95 and the, the core of the fundamental right on data protection is not negotiable, full stop. And um, the, uh, uh, the flexibility of how we are implementing these principles and basic sets of rules in a different environments, especially there where we need to develop new ideas, like, for example, how is consent uh, uh, given the best by, uh, in, in the online environment if I'm not directly identified, you know, if, uh, how we can involve producers in the whole issue of privacy by design principles, and all these questions, how to really reach these uh, new ideas, these new set of rules, uh, that is to be debated, and of course, I remain very flexible on uh, reacting to ideas which are good and which should be implemented. Um, while I'm uh, collecting, uh, you know, uh, questions uh, from the audience on strategic point, please. Perhaps, Cecile, you could you take the lead? Uh, yes, and I I'll address to my my la the, our last panelist, so Costas. Uh, you represent the book, uh, the consumers, and uh, so for you, uh, considering what is on the table, so you have the, the text from the Commission and then the Parliament proposals, um, for which point, one or two points, um, would, you, would you be ready to fight to have them kept uh, in, in a final text, and against which uh, other points would you fight to have them deleted or changed? So, mm -hmm. could you could you enlighten that? Thank you. Well, many thanks for the question, and many thanks for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be back. And I think before I answer your question, I think we should go back to the basic because you asked like, what is the point that consumers are ready to fight for? And unfortunately, we see that. We had high expectations from the revision, and the Commission proposal confirmed the expectations and responded to the expectations. But then when the discussion started in the European Parliament, I must say that consumer organizations across Europe and beyond were really frustrated to see how the consumer dimension of the proposal, of the revision, was very easily forgotten. 
that all of a sudden the focus moved to uh, administrative burden of the business, uh, more obligations. Uh, we forgot very easily that the proposal is nothing more but a specification of the existing rights and obligations. Unfortunately, those rights and obligations are not implemented in practice, are not enforced. And maybe this is why companies woke up all of a sudden and said, well, now we have to comply with the laws because we, we might suffer very strong sanctions. But there is nothing, almost nothing new in the proposal. And the focus and the aim of the revision was really because we are in the middle of a trust crisis. Consumers do not trust the way businesses uh, behave. And it's really frustrating to see that the only growing business is the one that is based on the stealing of property from consumers, because personal data is consumers' property. So I think we are ready to fight, and we will fight. This is a key priority for all consumer organizations uh, for the year to come. We are ready to fight to really to remind, to restore the core of the revision, which is give, co give control back to the consumers because it's their own personal data. Of course, there are key provisions, and starting from the definitions, we need to have broad definitions. We need to have a definition that we do not need to revise in 10, 15 years. We should not start by narrowing down, narrowing down, excluding uh, different types of uh, uh, information from the beginning. And we need strong rights. And and we also need strong enforcement, strong redress, strong sanctions. And I'm really surprised that many companies complain about the high level of the sanctions. Well, if you are a complying company, why are you afraid? Because if you comply with the law, you will never have a strong sanction against you. If you don't comply with the law, it's fair to say that you need to pay the price for that. In other fields of uh, areas of law, like competition law, uh, and I find a lot of similarities because, again, like, Damages affect many people. They are, uh, sometimes they are uh, not of uh, material value. Uh, it's very hard to quantify. There you see the difference in the approach of the companies because they are really afraid of competition authorities. But they're not afraid of data protection authorities. They are not afraid of consumer protection authorities simply because the level of the sanctions are not the same. So we are ready to fight and we will fight for the overall um, aim of the revision, which is to give control back to the individuals, and then, of course, starting from definitions, um, enforcement, strong rights. Um, of course, there are issues that um, we're always willing to discuss and negotiate, and, and we also we do not want to kill innovation, but we think that the proposal of the Commission and uh, Jan's uh, draft report, there are positive steps, they are on the right uh, direction. Um, talk about uh, the obligations, for example, for data controllers. This is something that I think, I see the argument that we need to introduce some more flexibility, but this is a question also to the audience and to the business, because I think that it's very easy if you are a big company, you have a lot of human, technical, financial resources, it's very easy and very com comfortable to ask for flexibility, to say that, well, I don't want prescriptive rules because you kill innovation, give me the freedom to implement privacy policies because, and I agree, big companies should have the freedom to implement uh, some privacy policies, comprehensive privacy policies, but what about the European ICT companies? 95% of the European ICT companies are small and medium enterprises. And what we see also from the consumer protection area, what SMEs need is a checklist. Prescriptive rules that give you legal certainty that you can really tick the box and say, I did that, I complied, I complied, I complied. It's a very difficult balance to find, to find uh, between the interests of the big companies and the European companies. And this is also an area where we're also disappointed because we're really surprised to see that European companies simply align themselves behind the position of American companies and American uh, US interests. The interests are not the same. The challenges are not the same. The sides are not the same. And this is something that European policymakers should also keep in their mind. Their role is not to facilitate more US business in Europe. It's really to facilitate EU innovation and give trust back to European citizens as consumers. Thank you, Kostas. So, um, perhaps now uh, we, we have uh, how, how much time, Johan? Uh, Five minutes, ten minutes? Yes, I think we have su sufficient time. Okay. Uh, let, let's focus uh, on, on a question to both uh, rapporteurs because we give the floor. And, and please ask for questions on strategic uh, points in, in the meantime. Consent, uh, because we are still uh, speaking about controllers, um, sanctions, but let's speak for a second about the data subject. Uh, 
Consent is extremely central in, in your viewpoint. Uh, Mrs. Lebai highlighted that consent is one of the requirements, but you, you, you put a lot of emphasis on, on, on this. Um, how much this is realistic in the information society, why you put a lot of emphasis on, on this, and how you, uh, from the consumer side, evaluate it in, in, in a concise manner. Yeah, I, I, I try to be short. It's, um, what, what I, I mean, it, it's clear what uh, Francoise Lebay has said uh, is, is true, and it will stay true. Consent is not the only legal base for processing, and, uh, and that is also what uh, we still will follow. But the problem is, since we adopted the old directive, more and more there was a split between the expectation of those conducting business uh, saying we need uh, to process our data on the basis of legitimate interest because uh, there is no uh, possibility to do it different or to, uh, to ask for consent. It would diminish our possibilities. And on the other side, the consumers expecting that normally they are asked uh, before their data are processed. So uh, how to deal with this split? So we had a look into the basic provisions. We talked with all of them, uh, with all of the people uh, about either on the one hand their expectations about what do you think that you have to agree on and all those uh, who think that they have an overriding interest uh, uh, to be respected, uh, that ha they have still the possibility to process data without the consent of the data subject. And there are some and we try to uh, better than the Commission line out, not in a, uh, a delegated act which then will somehow be adopted somewhere, uh, uh, to line out in the basic legal provisions where as a rule, not as a final list, but as a rule, the interest of the controller overrides the interest of the uh, data subject and where the uh, interest or the rights of the data subjects would overrule the uh, rights of the uh, a controller. That, of course, is uh, always up to interpretation, uh, and uh, there will always be some gray zones, but it's no more clear that now we lined up some examples where we think that there is the possibility for, trans uh, uh, for um, processing data without the consent of the data subject. Those will be still quite many uh, fields and it will be still quite a huge amount of personal data being processed without the consent of the data subject. But I think it's important to bring together a bit these very, very different expectations. And I would ask both sides to agree that this is really necessary because without common expectation and common interpretation, the loose of trust is somehow pre-programmed. We will have it at some occasions that people say, this is absolutely ridiculous. Why is this not happening without my consent? Or uh, this is uh, absolutely uh, unacceptable. Why can't we do that without the consent? So we have a, a division and that need to be closed again. And I think there are many reasonable positions which are in my report now and there are perhaps some unreasonable positions which shouldn't be in this legitimate interest anymore. Yeah. Uh, I hope we will come back to this point with regard to uh, pseudonyms uh, and, and consent uh, with regard to uh, this uh, new category of, of data. What, but mm -hmm. first, what's your position yeah. on? I think I Are you satisfied? <laughs> uh, we are satisfied uh, because the starting point is like it is made clear now that consent is simply one of the legal grounds because um, I think this argument of consent has been abused a little bit by the businesses because they focus only on this and they say well consent I think it's their advantage because through the consent uh, sometimes they uh, get the consumer the individual to consent to give away data that do not comply with the fundamental principles I think consent is good basis for certain cases, but not for all cases. And I think some of the misunderstandings in the world debate over the last year, uh, at least in the Brussels bubble, is that sometimes the argument about the strict requirement of consent 
is used for cases where consent is not appropriate. For example, if I'm going to conclude a transaction online, of course, my name, my address, my public information is necessary, and this is part of the contractual uh, transaction. This is necessary for the contractual arrangement. But if this data is going to be used then for secondary purposes, then we get out of the contractual arrangement, and then you might need consent. But we should not put everything in the same bubble and say, consent will destroy innovation, will destroy everything. It's not the case. Okay, so uh, now we open the floor to, uh, to the audience. So if you, if you have a question, either on the consent point or even on other strategic point, you can have the floor. So, um, uh, who is going to circulate the microphone around? Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Should we agree on the first round or three, four questions on the strategic point and, and then we come back to a second round, please? Be brief as, uh, okay. as much as possible. Uh, on consent, two remarks. Uh, the first remark is that if you look at the architecture of the, the data protection uh, regulations and the proposal, consent actually is very strange, a very strange uh, legitimation of, uh, reason. Why? Because a processor might process for legitimate aims, meaning that every legitimate processing is legitimate, legitimate without consent. And that means that consent could only be used for processings which are illegitimate. And so I've, I think it's very strange to, to, to fall back on consent. And the second point, very, very briefly, in my opinion, it is one of the features of consumer law to protect consumers against consent. Yeah, why? Because consent is always the best mean to have things done when there is power relationship. And in most of the time, in most of the processings today, the one who gives consent has actually no choice because the data processing is in his interest. And I think so that consent is a very dangerous thing for consumers. Um, good point, uh, but please try to make questions, okay. uh, hopefully short, very short and provocative questions to respect the uh, invitation from organizers. So, who takes the lead? Do you have a provocative question? Well, I hope so. Um, is there some way of improving the transparency with regard to the lobbying that has been going on with regard to the regulation? I mean, I think uh, Jan, Phillips, uh, uh, Jan Philipp Albrecht's uh, uh, idea of, of publishing his uh, diary would be a good start, but is there some way of additionally improving transparency with regard to the lobbying that's been going on, especially uh, external to the EU? Uh, should we complete the first round of questions and then you, you decide who, who is going to answer? Uh, I have a question. Uh, if we look at that whole set of patients' data, there's, first of all, there is a fundamental charter which states Article 3 that informed consent to become a patient in principle is obligatory requirement and it's constitutional provision. And then if you say, secondly, that consent is one of the provisions, but not uh, uh, among other ones, then I'm wondering how we will, deal with, will, we will deal with patient data when the Constitution is stating that informed consent to become a patient is a fundamental right of EU. I have a, a special comment on this uh, as a footnote to the today answer. Hi, uh, quick question. My, my name is Greg Pollard. I represent the Association for Competitive Technology. Good to see you again, Jan. Um, quick question to Kostas first. Uh, Kostas, you, you, you said a very good thing, uh, that you know, SMEs should have a very simplified way of complying with the law. And therefore, the, the, this question about a checklist, as long as you know, it doesn't bring about too much complexity or cost, uh, would be welcome. And I'm wondering if uh, Jan has any ideas as to how to implement that in the law to get away with complexity that might falter because at the end of the day we want this to be implemented and the SMEs will be the ones that are, need to implement it. And on your comment of US versus European interests, I mean, SMEs in tech, you know, the business models and interests don't really have borderlines. So I'd be interested in understanding, you know, where do you see the big divide between the interest of tech SMEs in Europe versus tech SMEs in the US? Because at the end of the day, we're trying to find out ways to comply with privacy on each side of the Atlantic whilst trying to 
achieve you know, a good legal certainty and, and business uh, investment. Thank you. A good question. We only collect short, spicy, and, and precise questions. A uh, quick question to Jan. Um, we note in your report that there was an addition for pseudonymous data. Uh, there's a push tonight in an event organized by a U.S. lobby group on removing consent for pseudonymous data. European Commission, as late as five years ago, stated that pseudonymous identifiers were still unique identifiers and not acceptable without consent for the purposes of tracking consumer behavior. Why are we now going back to something which was, which was unacceptable five years ago is now suddenly being pushed by U.S. pressure groups? What about the last one for, the, uh, for this first round? No more spies from the audience? Charles. Uh, maybe this is spicy. Uh, Charles Rabb, University of Edinburgh. Uh, Jan, um, how far do you trust the Commission only to uh, intervene with the proposed board uh, in very rare circumstances, as uh, Madame Labai suggested? That's your turn. Um, Okay, I try to uh, remember all the points. Um, first of all, the question of consent. Um, so, we have this split of expectations, not only obviously with how data is treated in the view of consent or not consent, so legitimate interest. We have this split also between those then to this problem, finding the answer of saying, okay, then let's have only legitimate interest, and those saying, then let's have rules, legal rules, on how data processing is taking place. And I think that uh, both cannot be the solution to the problem saying uh, then we, we don't ask for consent anymore and, and controllers just uh, do their best to protect the interest of the consumers uh, is something which uh, didn't work out through all the years and where I would say also the expectation uh, or the foreseeability of consumers is reduced to zero because they are just, uh, I mean, in, in, in a position to not decide anything. They, they are only nannied by people, you know? So it's, uh, uh, but the other way around would be also the wrong way to say that now the, uh, the legislator should decide for the individuals uh, only in which uh, specific cases uh, uh, data processing can take place or should take place and in, uh, in which circumstances and how that sh should be carried out by the controllers uh, is, is also somehow nannying everything and, and it's also not really giving uh, self-determination to the citizens because if I want to uh, expose my data then I should be also able to do so. Uh, but of course there are some areas and that's what, for example for the patient uh, issues and all the health data or also research, freedom of information where I think that there should be some rules on the question how these uh, how personal data somehow can be processed and uh, because then for example consent uh, is perhaps not the right approach but for, for everything which we don't see as society necessary to regulate it we should say consent is the basis because it creates somehow a level playing field between me and the one which I'm giving the data and so 30 seconds on transparency with regard to lobbies yeah, uh, okay, just before one word on the Commission uh, Trust. Um, I would say, I mean, uh, generally, I don't trust uh, uh, governments nor the Commission. Um, and uh, my, uh, my opposition to, to Paul Nemitz's nice words that the Commission, of course, is the most independent uh, body uh, is that this is just right now changing. We are having a more politicized European Union where the European Commission is more taking the position of a government than a position of an, a very independent regulator. Uh, so that's a political answer generally. But in, in this specific moment, of course, it's 
it's clear, for example, the European Parliament hasn't, ha has not the right to initiative, initiative. So if there's a real problem with this legislation being somehow wrongly applied, and we need to change something, we need to give the opportunity to the Commission to perhaps uh, uh, propose an adjustment or propose uh, a clarification. So it could make sense to, at the end of some development, or some process, that there's uh, the possibility for the Commission to come up with, with new solutions. And we will think about how we can do that. But in the, co in the consistency mechanism, my proposal was very much uh, bringing back only the DPAs to first of all find a solution and then the courts to give some wording, you know, and only if the courts say something which is then non, not implemented by the reality, then there should be a review by the legislator and we cannot do it on our own. So that's a very complex issue of European law behind that. Of course, we cannot give also the DPAs only the position of the co-legislator. It's also not possible. So uh, this is a very complex issue, uh, uh, but I try to somehow uh, answer that. Now, uh, I have only one second on transparency. As I said, I think the most important what we can do today is to be as transparent as, and as honest and as reasonable as possible because otherwise we will not get the legitimacy for such a wide-ranging European legislation. I said that again and again in that clarity. I'm a pro-European, I'm working on European rules, I see the necessity of having European rules on these highly internet-connected uh, dossiers, so they're, they're for global and digitalized uh, 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 rules, but I also see that this will never be accepted if we are not reasonable, transparent, and really honest in our approach to that. And I really ask ourselves, all of us, to, to be that as best as possible. I say 30 seconds because you have now a question from with regard to American and European SMEs. I thought that was to Greg, yeah. but yes, please. Uh, uh, what I was saying is like the European industry uh, dealing active in this area, they are mainly SMEs. In the U.S. side, they are not all SMEs. They are also the, you also have the big companies, and the challenge of the sizes and the resources are not the same. One example where I personally witnessed the difference in the thinking was in the Internet of Things expert group of the European Commission, where, as you know, there were a lot of um, um, innovators from around the world involved. And then when we started talking about uh, privacy by design, immediately the reaction was like, so do you expect us? who innovate to think about privacy. And that, was, that came from non, the non-European companies in the room. Of course, the European companies, they have the laws, and they try to struggle more to comply with the laws. In the US or in other areas of the world, they don't have such, such strong requirements. They don't have the privacy um, approach uh, automatically in their mind when they develop uh, new technologies. Uh, and then one thing about the transparency, because I'm really tempted, just a question to everybody, like, because we really, these, those days we had the American colleagues uh, visiting uh, Brussels and we had the long discussions. Imagine, would it ever be possible for the European Commission or MEPs or any European company to go to the US Congress and try to interfere so directly and so aggressively with the US decision-making process? And still, in Europe, we allow the US Department of Commerce, the U.S. companies, the U.S. government to tell Europe how to deal with such an important issue with a fundamental constitutional right in Europe. On, on patient rights, uh, unless uh, Jan would like to say something more specific, let, let me uh, thank you uh, for your point. Um, of course, we, we should make a distinction uh, between uh, consent to the medical care and, and consent to the processing of personal uh, data. Uh, second, uh, there is an article uh, in the draft regulation giving more space uh, for marginal maneuver at national uh, level. Third, uh, let me be for a second uh, informal ambassador of the um, epidemiological society. Uh, they have a lot of concerns. Uh, they feel themselves distant from the legislator. Uh, we have been approached as a DPS uh, to discuss the, uh, the reform. Well, we are not the legislator. Let me invite you uh, to simply accept a meeting with them and, and to see what the points are, uh, what is reasonable and perhaps already solved in the regulation, and if 
uh, also with regard to the use of pseudonyms, which is repeatedly discu discussed with regard to the, to the business area, uh, what should be, should be uh, analyzed. Um, pseudonyms was the last question. Uh, would you like some of you um, say something on that? Just one word. As it was uh, asked, I mean, I, I tried to answer that quite clearly, that with all personal data, consent should be the rule, and that should be uh, also applied to pseudonymized data. But what we are working on and what we should together try to achieve is how, in those cases, consent can be given more easier, more simply, by technical means, you know? We're, we're talking about different approaches on, for example, do not track, or on, on, on those technical standards which could be developed to make it easy for both sides to communicate if I'm okay or not. And by that, don't be in the uh, position to always explain who exactly you are and so on, you know? So I, I think that is what we have to develop by saying clearly uh, all this is about personal data and uh, consent should be the basis for everything in that. Um, we have 15 minutes more. Um, let me add uh, spice to, to spice. Um, Data protection as a package. We, we appreciate it a lot. You and, and the other rapporteur, Mr. Drusus, said uh, in the presentation of your reports that you uh, would like to uh, consider the two instruments uh, together. Uh, indeed, the DPS as well insisted a lot of a need of comprehensiveness, not only with regard to the grid zones, but because there, are, there is a lot of uncertainty. Um, processing of personal data uh, by private controllers uh, in the interest uh, of uh, law enforcement bodies or uh, with regard to data which, which are uh, uh, used for law enforcement bodies just in the latest uh, stage. Um, and there are also other examples. So we appreciated your reference to the, to the package, but perhaps in the Council they, they, they have different priorities. Um, so perhaps they are oriented to work in a sort of a two-step uh, uh, approach. So one side you included a uh, reference to Regulation 45-2001 to be applied to EU institutions and body. We appreciated a lot this reference, but then we are still reflecting on what we may expect on uh, the joint discussion of regulation and the directive. What are you ready to do to work on this perspective, uh, Jan? So generally, you have to you have to see, and that is sometimes for, forgotten, that uh, by definition we have always stricter rules for public administrations and especially for police and uh, uh, law enforcement institutions than for everything uh, everybody else, and that's important also because though there we are in really sensitive areas of fundamental rights and. Uh, of the question also of checks and balances in a democratic society. And uh, that, of course, uh, poses many questions today uh, because, of course, there are uh, people who have to supply security under pressure to also show that in a globalized world uh, we still are able to, and in a digitalized world, we are still able to uh, secure uh, uh, the rule of law and, and security. Uh, and um, therefore, of course, there are quite heavy debates on the question, for example, on the retention of personal data by public authorities for law enforcement purposes, for uh, the question how they can do uh, uh, profiling with the effect of criminal sanctions, for example, and so on. And, and that's a very uh, important uh, question which cannot be answered so simple. Uh, so, uh, what I want to answer is it's important that we have this package because not more and more these both fields interconnect somehow because law enforcement is taking place also on the basis of information retained by private companies. Uh, public authorities are using private techniques and systems also, so that has to be seen also. It's highly interconnected, so we have to see those things together. But when it comes to police and uh, justice law enforcement, it's always uh, a separate question which has to be debated on the whole issue of how we reconcile the uh, different views of how to reach security the best and how to 
uh, protect uh, fundamental rights the best in a democratic society. And uh, that is highly debated. I would say that is uh, worth another panel. And uh, we, should, uh, we should just uh, say clearly that uh, the uh, directive on, uh, on data protection is as important as the regulation. It has different stakeholders, but it, it's as important. We have to work on that. But uh, it, the package is because of an interinstitutional conflict also, because we have seen that in the police and justice area, the council has denied its necessity to build minimum standards in uh, police and justice procedures over years by enhancing cooperation in police and justice very much. And this cannot go together. That the European Parliament, which is only with the Lisbon Treaty in the position to uh, really have a voice on that set over years that this imbalance is unacceptable. And therefore, it's clear that we need these rules at the same time as we also have rules uh, on all the other sectors. But I would say uh, that was, as I said, another panel also. Uh, time is running, and we only have uh, four minutes. One question from that side, uh, Mr. Bowden. Um, I assume the question is spicy as such. Uh, in the middle, uh, Bowden, Casper Bowden. Yes, I will, I will come to you. I wanted to return to the question of pseudonymous data. Could, could the panel reaffirm their commitment to ensuring that there isn't just consent for use of pseudonymous data, but there is the right of access and deletion to pseudonymous data? That's still very, very important to ensure. Okay. Another question from... Given over Stratton from the law firm Linklaters, I wanted to come back to a recent article which was published by uh, Mr. Alvaro on uh, the contextual issue, more risk based, and I would like to have your views on this approach, on the risk based approach. Thank you. You, you mean the one on the life cycle management? That's right. Thank okay. you. Anybody else? The last one, please. Yes, uh, I have a question for Costas. Um, how do you see this control over personal data? Is litigation, after the fact, uh, a big part of it or not? Okay. I can start and then I leave the final word to Jan. Starting from uh, your last, uh, the last question, uh, no, we, do not, we are not obsessed with litigation, but litigation might come if there is an assess, if there is a breach, there needs to be litigation. Uh, we are, I think that the uh, validity of the law is really to prevent the need for litigation, to prevent uh, breaches, to prevent damage being uh, caused. And that's what we accept from responsible and accountable companies, and this is why we need the regulation to make sure that personal data will be processed in a lawful manner. But if there is a breach, yes, then litigation is one of uh, the ways to um, mitigate uh, the damage suffered by individuals, and then we can have another discussion about different means of litigation. About the question about uh, whether the right to access and deletion applies to pseudonymous data, we fully agree, and uh, this is a point that when it comes, we even go a bit further, and we also have concerns as to whether uh, anonymous data should be exempted overall from a uh, specific provision of the regulation. And then the risk-based approach. Uh, to be honest, I have not read the article by Mr. Alvaro, so it's a bit unfair to comment on it, but the risk-based approach, uh, yes, but we should not forget that the aim of the law is to be generally valid. So we should not really, um, from the beginning, limit, narrow the scope, because we don't know what the developments will be. On specific provisions, I think the proposal and Jan's approach really take this risk-based approach into consideration, but we should not, from the beginning, really water down all the provisions, saying we should really narrow it down, focusing on the risk and specific harm. So the uh, right to access and deletion, of course, is uh, a right which applies to all personal data. Um, as I said, we have to work out um, technical ways how to conduct all these rights 
and there I really count on innovation. So that's also something we really want to incentivize by this uh, uh, regulation and by this broad setting by saying, okay, there has to be innovation in that uh, uh, direction and also this will be, uh, uh, yeah, scrutinized by, for example, audits and, uh, and you will really benefit by developing new technologies respecting these rights. Um, the question, um, on uh, from behind, I, I, I just forgot. Ah, the risk-based approach, of course. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, had really many sessions together with Alexander Iru, where we went through all these ideas, and especially uh, the idea of having uh, simplified information. On, for example, the uh, on the privacy terms to to really um, inform people better about the different uh, the different categories of different risks also involved by having standard standardized simple icons, for example, in in the digitalized environment that works quite well and that would improve the information of the consumers, of the users, by knowing here there are those categories or those kinds of data processing technologies or uh, uh, measures involved and here the others. And by di thereby also alerting differently the consumers when giving their consent also gives the opportunity of uh, the decision on the side of the consumer if uh, I scrutinize the whole thing more or less, if I just click yes or if I want to read the privacy terms uh, still, you know? And um, I think that's a very good approach. What cannot be done, and that is some so somehow also a misunderstanding uh, coming from, from this debate only with some buzzwords is that we give uh, somehow the decision to the controller to, de to decide what is a risky processing on and what not. That cannot be done be at the end because there is not such a risky, uh, such a thing as a risky processing or non-risky processing. Uh, every uh, personal data and its processing can have significant consequences in, in a various amount of uh, issues. And that's also why it's so important to give the information in a very easy and good good way to the consumer, to the user, because he or she can decide the best what is risky for him or her and what perhaps not. And uh, then just uh, uh, a, last, a last word, or, or I leave it like that. I, I think I have uh, answered the most questions. Uh, I don't want to be so. You will have the, the last word, but please, Cecile. Yes, so <clears throat> to summarize, uh, we, we have come to the end of our panel and our discussions. And uh, to summarize a bit uh, uh, the ideas that have uh, been shared uh, around uh, this table. So um, it's true that we have come to a point where uh, we are all focused on um, the, the data subject or the citizen or the consumer. So uh, m m much importance is given to this actor, you know. Um, we, uh, it has been told about uh, trust crisis, and trust is a very important word. We have seen, we have heard it um, uh, for the, the parliament um, uh, legislative for, for this, uh, this element of this legislature, which is the parliament, and and also for, for the consumer. So, uh, it is important to to focus on uh, on this actor uh, who is the data subject whatever his uh, the name we give to it to him and to then um, there is concern about rights and um, and balances reached to uh, uh, around this actor and should we give him um, the autonomy and then consent becomes um, uh, the core of the of of his action, or or should we protect him against him? Um, uh, uh, so uh, this is part of of the debate. Uh, another point um, is uh, of, uh, has been around that the, the problem of the flexibility and a long life um, for for the for the text we will uh, reach. 
uh, against uh, legal certainty. So uh, it's true, uh, legal certainty, uh, the parliament is really focused on this point and uh, tries to clarif clarify uh, as much as possible uh, all the terms uh, and uh, the points made. And so um, this, this is uh, perhaps against flexibility and we, we have seen that it's, it's still a, a problem to be tackled. Uh, and so, um, uh, yes, perhaps uh, these these were the points where uh, well we we, ha we had uh, input from from our panelists. Uh, uh, Giovanni, you, you wanted to know whether our audience were, I was simply, pleased. I want to simply say thank you to uh, to all. Although this was one of the three uh, parallel sessions, uh, you see the crowded uh, audience, um, and uh, what it means uh, that we, we are all uh, uh, following uh, you. Uh, it's a, a difficult uh, challenge. Uh, we trust. I think you are in the right track. But the devil is into details. Uh, as soon as we read the details of your report, we, we find space for further reflections. When you clarify, for instance, about the scope of application of the regulation, uh, to uh, count, uh, people which is established in third countries offering goods and services to EU residents. And you say, okay, regardless of, um, irrespective of whether payment is required for those goods or services, and then one may say, is this necessary? It's useful, but is this necessary? When you say we should move from uh, the monitoring of the behavior of the data subject to the monitoring of data subject, and then the reaction could be, should we include in the regulation a reference uh, giving lawfulness to the monitoring of a data subject? So details are to be discussed. We, we trust on the effectiveness of, of your uh, work as a, as a rapporteur. At the same time, we are confident about transparency, and we hope to be all able to contribute to the details. Thank yeah. you for uh, your today's uh, participation. Thank you to the audience.